Good afternoon, allemaal. Welcome. This evening will be in English, so I hope that's not a problem because we have a few guests who don't speak Dutch. So, obviously, we move to English, or in this case. Uh, first, I have a little bit of a sad um, announcement. Um, just before we started uh, yeah, uh, preparing this meeting today, um, uh, us reached the announcement that Erban Olaf, one of the members of the first, one of our first members, let's say that, uh, 2014, died today, I believe. Very well known photographer, probably everybody knows his work. Here he is. And yeah, sad. Okay. Again, welcome. Um, I'm Lisbeth Bick, artist and chair of the Society of the Arts, part of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Art and Science, KNW. Climate Narrative, Climate Narratives, this series that we are in today, is a public series that seeks to bring together artists and scientists of the Academy of Arts, the Jonge Academy, the Jonge Academy, and KNW, and artists and scient scientists outside of these institutions also not artists and not scientists sometimes, to create alliances to foster opportunities to inform, speculate, and create effective and affective and effective narratives and imaginaries for climate action. What is now imposing itself prominently, and I, you know, I probably repeat something that everybody already knows or becomes more and more aware of globally on the political agenda, was not perceived as urgent some years ago, even though various scientific studies have been predicting have been predicting since the 1970s and 60s that we would go out of business on a planetary scale. We didn't listen. Today's situation is an un unholy combination of growing world population, a loss of fertile ground and clean water and the unrelenting demand for more more housing, more industry, more roads, more agriculture, more energy, and more growth. We have entered an ever-accelerating loop. Our common ground, in a literal and philosophical sense, is sinking beneath our feet. The reports of, inter of the Intergovernmental panel, panel on Climate Change, IPPC, underscores the urgency of taking ambitious action to secure a livable, sustainable future for us all. If we understand eco as our home, then what is happening to our home? Crises are affecting societies and lives, and the current struggle over definitions and conceptions of democracy is symptomatic of the dramatic changes in the character of public life. This is cross-generational and runs deep into the future of the yet to be lived. The yet to live. Ma, ma, okay, the yet to come to life, yeah. We are colonizing that future Therefore, we must seriously engage in the urgent, inevitable, necessary transition. How? Not with the same narratives that cause the problems. To be effective, we must also tell the stories effectively. Alfred Korzybski, and I've told this anecdote more and more before, and I tell it again because I like it so much. <laughs> so many of you maybe heard it already. Alfred Korzybski, who became known as the idea for the idea that the map is not the territory, emphasized that man lives in two worlds, two worlds, in the world of language and symbols and in the real world. He observed that the human mind is only able to respond to the formed map and completely forgets, in the extreme case, the territory present. Seen this way, the smartphone and artificial intelligence changed our emotional orientation and relationship with the world. And this is a cru crucial shift. You live primarily in the beautiful ma map rather than in the devastated area. The words of Suzanne Moser, co-writer of the IPPC report, also resonate. She sees the despair of climate scientists as they watch the disaster unfolding and argues for a space where facts and imagination meet. She asked, what would happen if we acted with a head and a heart? Art and science research is a testing ground for developing new ways of thinking and powerful action, actions towards a change, a model of growing together. We need to invent the cultural techniques by which we take responsibility for our territory and strategize. 
Our advising letter to the then Minister Dijkgraaf in 2022, advocating a national program for experimental research at the intersection of art and science, is part of this strategy, as well as the position paper, an initiative of Kunst 92, Academy of Arts, Waag Future Lab and Federatie Creatieve Industrie, published in August 2023. Both plea for curiosity-driven research collaborations between artists and scientists to reinvent the future together. Tonight's subtitle is Art, Science and Climate, Aiming for Impact. We will discuss how scientific institutions could increase the impact of their research and the role of artists and creatives at an interface between science and policy. And I'm very happy to introduce the speakers that we will all meet and discuss with tonight. Lisbeth van der Grift, here in the front row, is the first one who will take the stage. She is a member of the Young Academy, professor of international history and the environment at University of Utrecht, and deeply involved in the Center of Environmental Humanities. Lisbeth is fulfilling a bridging role between kin, of which she has been part of the task force before it was even named KIN, uh, the, the Netherlands Climate Institute, and Humanities and the Arts. She will respond from her perspective to the proceedings within the context of Dutch climate institutions and discuss how KIN might consider interdisciplinarity while it takes form. Artist Daniel Frota de Abreu, Abreu will, on, will be online from Brazil with his film when objectivity, when objectivity Backfires. This is screened. This film analyzes, analyzes the debates on environmental politics between Brazilian government of Bolsonaro and the scientific community, focusing on the effect of the rhetoric of climate deniers against satellite Im imagery and deforestation alerts in the Amazon rainforest, as it, as it is spread in the media. Then artists Julian Thomas and Ekaterina Volkova, residents at the Jan van Eyck Academy in Maastricht, with whom I conceived this evening, explore the social embeddedness of how facts are a product of specific ways of seeking knowledge. Together with PhD candidate Lisette van Beek, and I hope she's here maybe. Yeah, great, <laughs> welcome. Uh, and the image modeling team, they engaged with the so-called global integrated assessment models, the scientific computer simulations that provide information to the IPPC regarding future impacts and strategies to mitigate climate change. These models can be used to help us to conceive of, conceive of complex interactions that are otherwise incomprehensible for the human mind. Rather than seeking a different way of communicating science, for example, an image with a theory or something, Julian and Ekaterine propose alternative ways of modeling sustainable futures. This, this resulted in the future manual for future models, and they will talk about that, but probably also about other things. We'll see. So they will discuss the larger potential impact of this work with Detlef van Vuren. Detlef is a KNW member and a senior researcher at the PBL, among many, many other things, working on integrated assessments of global environmental problems, and in particular, climate change. Within this field, his focus is, among others, on the relationship between climate change and trends in world energy use, climate policy and scenario development. He also has been involved with the work of, inter of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPPC. Unfortunately, Jeff Diamanti had to cancel because he is sick, but fortunately, Katja Kwastek has, ag has agreed to take over. Thank you, very happy. Katja is a professor of modern and contemporary art history at the Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam. She researches through the arts the interrelations of human and non-human technological, cultural and biological timeframes. She is also a board member of the Environmental Humanities Center that is grounded in the realization that today's environmental crisis calls for an interdisciplinary approach. And I understand that you have also been a part of the Humanities Council of the KNW for a couple of years. So I'm very happy that you, she, 
uh, was able to commit to this on such a short notice. And I hope we will all have together also an inspiring conversations tonight, also with you, the public. So please take the floor when you feel like it. Uh, maybe one thing that is, uh, let's say, of um, uh, logistics, let's say. Uh, th there will be a mic on and off when the public can interfere. Uh, it will also be recorded, uh, screened. Uh, I forgot if it was direct or not direct. I forgot, but anyway, it will be visible on YouTube in the future. Um, and when the mic is going round or you need to ask a question, just please wait till the mic has reached you and then start talking and not before, because otherwise people will not be able to hear it on the recording. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We'll start. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lisbeth. Uh, it feels a little bit too formal to stand here uh, for what I'm about to do because basically what I wanted to do is uh, share some experiences, uh, some of my experiences with you. Um, I'm an environmental historian or basically a historian of environmental politics uh, and I've been involved in various uh, interdisciplinary and also increasingly transdisciplinary, so including societal uh, partners from beyond the university. Um, on topics of, uh, of climate change, uh, sustainability. Um, and um, yeah, I, I wanted to, to share some, um, some observations. At the same time, I don't really know who you are. Uh, so this, this might be too internal uh, a talk for you. Um, so I would, I would have preferred to do a round of introduction, but you are too many to, to do that. Uh, but I hope it's, uh, it's interesting uh, uh, to you nonetheless and, and gives you a bit of insight into, I think, some quite major, major changes that are actually going on both within uh, the university but also in the uh, interaction uh, between academic institutions um, and uh, sort of the outside world. Um, so I think, uh, what, well, basically what I've been, been saying as a humanities scholar, as an historian working on, uh, on, on environmental history and on basically the question, why are we here today? Uh, I, think every, I think that is a question that resonates with, uh, with many. Um, and um, I think, you know, that we, we've, we've arrived at, at a moment uh, in history where I think many of us realize that it's not enough to just have the better science and have our knowledge of climate science uh, and also not just to know what kind of technological uh, solutions may be available, but that it's, uh, well, part of the problem, and I think a large part of the problem of why change is so difficult, change towards a more sustainable uh, uh, society, has to do with, uh, with questions, uh, with issues that are, that sort of, traditionally belong to the domain of the social sciences and the humanities, right? So when do people change their behavior? When do social norms change and why? Why is it that in the past, you know, certain things that we nowadays, uh, you know, despise and think are uh, uh, despicable uh, were actually considered to be just legitimate and reasonable in the past? One can consider, uh, one can imagine that historians of the future will actually look at us uh, in, in a similar way and ask those questions. When did they, you know, when did norms start to change and why did, and why did it take so long, if that is uh, indeed the, uh, the case for people to change their behavior? But also, why is it, um, uh, what are ways to, to sort of effectively influence uh, politics? I noticed that that is a question that many colleagues who are working uh, in the field of climate science uh, ask me or ask sort of more generally, okay, so we know you know, what needs to be done, but why is it so difficult to actually get that message um, across? And also the dimension of the, the sort of global dimension, international relations uh, is important. And of course, imagining um, alternative futures. I think that is a key topic um, here today as well, and imagining um, just uh, and fair futures for all, including non-human, uh, more than human actors. So if I, if I look back uh, at the time in which I've been involved, um, I think what, what I would argue is that what we see is a sort of a change of where the discussion of whether climate change is actually happening 
and also uh, what the uh, you know what the influences of, of human actions is more or less passé. Of course, there are you know those places where this discussion is still taking place and the extent to which etc. But uh, I haven't seen Björk uh, Lomborg for a while, and I do remember about 10 years ago or so that that was sort of what was being spoken about at the, the talk show table. I think nowadays it's much more about the how uh, and, and, and how are we going to do it, um, but and also um, sort of delaying questions of, um, you know, what if, um, uh, what, if, what if we do this in the Netherlands and China doesn't do anything, what is the effect of that? So, so more sort of in that, in that realm. Um, secondly, I think uh, climate change, the fact that climate change is, is happening, um, I think is much more sort of anchored in public uh, consciousness than, uh, uh, than, than five or ten years ago. And uh, if I talk with students about this, I think often they, they, you know, they, they, they have this sense of, uh, oh, you know, from the 1970s we've known this, and why, or, or you have known this, because they weren't there yet. Uh, and uh, nothing has been done. Uh, well, I think it's obvious and, and clear that not enough has, has been done. Um, but I think it's also important to realize actually how fast this change has occurred that we now all talk about climate change, whereas not that long ago it was about um, uh, uh, greenhouse gases, of course, but also more sort of delineated uh, problems of, you know, we need to save energy. I mean, that was all what, what it was about in the 1970s a lot. So. Um, you know, my students writing uh, theses, research papers, uh, writing about climate change in the 1970s, and I have to make them aware of that there was actually a lot of different kinds of problems that people spoke about, but not in this broader framework of climate change. And I think actually it's a, it's a major change that has taken place. Um, another um, one is, um, I think in, if, if we look at academia then, uh, and academic uh, you know, institutions, I would say that there is a, that the assertiveness of disciplines that are not traditionally considered to be climate science uh, has become bigger. So uh, I think just recently, last week, there was a, an article in Financial Dagblad in the financial newspaper of I think 20 economists or so who were writing that it didn't make sense to have fossil subsidies. It was like you know turning the heating on and at the same time the air conditioning. So it didn't make sense. But I, th I just thought, you know, this assertiveness by which they presented themselves as basically as climate scientists in the sense of we, we are economists, economists and we know a lot about what kind of, you know, policies and incentives, etc., lead to actually lead to change and, and make sense from an economic point of view. Um, I think, you know, 10 years ago, that was not so, um, uh, that, that, that was not so usual that historians, uh, economists, uh, uh, psychologists, etc., uh, anthropologists would also present themselves as uh, scholars who have something to say when it comes to the changing climate and the response to that. Following from that assertiveness, or maybe it's, it's sort of a parallel, is also the increasing approaches, approaching of disciplines. Uh, and, and probably the assertiveness is a, sort of a precondition of that. So, um, I have a sense that there is a bigger openness among all disciplines uh, and, and a recognition that no one actually has the answers and that we need the entire disciplinary uh, spectrum uh, to actually come to some sort of understanding of what is going on uh, at the moment. And um, I actually like that. I mean, I don't like the situation uh, where we're in, but this fact that you know, everyone is becoming, I think, a little bit more modest in the sense of, and also more aware of what are the boundaries to one's own sort of knowledge and field. And then also perhaps inviting others to tell you what it is that, you know, you're missing and what others can, uh, can bring to that problem um, and to that approach. Um, and la a last sort of movement that I see is that um, this, I think this openness, but also, of course, the sense of urgency are leading to projects, to initiatives that are really uh, aimed at uh, fostering interdisciplinary and increasingly transdisciplinary uh, collaboration um, as well, um, both within academia, but also in society. Um, I think there are lots of, uh, sort of, uh, of citizen-based initiatives going on uh, that we can think of, which are basically the start of 
sort of uh, um, innovation, right? Uh, trying out new forms of social, economic, uh, uh, political order, um, uh, which are also ways of imagining alternative futures, imagining regenerative uh, agriculture, for instance. Um, partly because of, uh, uh, you know, it's like, I think a response to if the government doesn't do enough, then we will just start doing this ourselves and show what is actually um, possible. Um, it's also a way of, of making that, making those possible futures uh, uh, imaginable in the, in the first place by just start acting them or acting upon them. Um, at the same time, there are some um, difficulties as well. Uh, I, I won't dwell on the difficulties, but we, 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 have, we have a tendency to talk about the difficulties. Uh, um, but uh, I think for, for many of the disciplines, the assertiveness on the one hand, and sort of trying to figure out who are we, for instance, as humanity scholars, if I talk from that perspective, sort of in the process of figuring out what is it that we want to do and that we can do when it comes to, to, to environmental uh, and climate uh, issues and biodiversity. While at the same time, there's already so much going on in terms of, you know, the KIN, for instance, being founded, the Climate Klimaatonderzoek Initiatief Nederland, um, that one also has to take part while still, you know, being in this identity formation uh, process. So that often leads to a kind of response, but, uh, but they don't recognize us, we're not being seen and, and perceived sufficiently, but also we're ourselves still figuring out what we are. Um, I think a second uh, difficulty is the sort of solution orientedness in many of these initiatives, which is difficult when, uh, when you're an artist, it's difficult when you're a humanities uh, scholar, we, because it's often very much about reflection, about taking a step back, delaying, wondering, maybe even sort of deliberately saying, well, let's not immediately move to solutions and to uh, continue to think about, in, think about this in terms of sort of development and we are going to manage this and we're going to fix this because I think there is a, a, a broadly felt sort of sense that actually this way of dealing with our natural environment uh, and, 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 and is, is actually, well, one of the causes that we're here today, right? So, um, uh, so, so that, that, is, um, uh, that is a difficulty and then third, just the urgency. I think we're trying to do all of these things in the best way that we can, and at the same time, we just know, you know, time is uh, ticking, and, and uh, at least that, this is my personal experience. Like, what, what, what can we do? How much time do we have? And, and um, um, can we do it carefully enough in the time that is um, available to us? So very briefly about uh, KIN, and then I will stop. I think KIN, Klimaatonderzoek Initiatief Nederland, is an example of those this increasing number of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary disciplines, uh, sorry, initiatives. Um, I think it's quite promising uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, what it has said is uh, we, we need system change. So it's really all of those disciplines. It's about the social, you know, cultural, ecological order that needs to change with all of its dimensions. Um, so the biochemical, the, but also the cultural, it's about the economics, it's about all of those um, dimensions in one. And that means the need to bring together uh, uh, scholars, academics from all um, disciplines. The idea is also that, that we're not going to establish another sort of center where there's a lot of money and everyone is going to compete for money and then we you know, just end up doing the same thing that we've always done. Uh, but really to see the kin as a facilitator of bringing together that which already exists, because we think that actually there a lot can be, uh, can be won. Um, and what I'm very much trying to sort of push for within the, uh, within the kin, um, and, and I think there's a general uh, positive attitude to that, is to, to, um, to embrace this, this sort of openness, this not knowing, uh, and also the re so the realization that we need others uh, and we need to do it together uh, and that we need to reduce competition as much as possible um, because that's just a waste of time and uh, time that we don't have. Um, what I would very much like to encourage uh, everyone here is, um, I guess, to, is, is to become involved uh, in the activities of the KIN. For example, there is a Krutzen workshop taking place in October. It's really a time investment, but it does mean it's on climate justice in, uh, in the urban environment. 
urban environments, it does mean that uh, one is actually able to help give shape to the programs that may come out of this. Of course, we do need money funding uh, at one point from the new cabinet. Um, and and um, I think you will find out that the way in which the kin is presented uh, and the way in which you know, kin might talk about the arts and talk about humanities questions that may not be the way in which you would yourself uh, when you're from those fields or, or in those roles, uh, how you would describe it. Uh, but I think what is needed now is really to, um, to, to come forward and to ourselves sort of present and tell others what, what it is that we can bring. So I think the, the openness and the willingness is there, but we cannot expect others to define what it is that the arts um, uh, can, can bring to the table. So that's up to us. Thank you very much. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me now? Great. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Everybody online as well. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for having me today. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't be there with you, but I will keep following today's program online. Um, uh, let me share my screen now. Um, In the beginning, Tupin lived in the void of the original night. First, he created his home in the skies and stars. Underneath, he created the water and the seas. Tupin came down as a storm, and in the moment his body touched the water, the sun appeared for the first time in the skies. With the heat, Tupin's skin started to crack open and peel off. As the skin started to fall over the seas, the lands were created. This is a fragment of an origin myth from the Guarani people in Brazil. In the Tupi Guarani mythology, Tupan is known as the spirit of the thunder. The following images are available online at the platform Terra Brasilis, built by the Brazilian National Institute for Space Research. The satellite monitoring program detects changes in the forest coverage in real time, issuing alerts to federal authorities about potential environmental crimes and areas in process of degradation due to logging, mining or fires. Based on these images, the Environmental Inspection Agency can act locally with preservation measures. The areas in black show the alerts of deforestation spots issued from 2019 up until today in the Amazon. If we take this image and overlay with the map of indigenous reserves and territories, it becomes clear how these lands and indigenous communities are key to the preservation of the Amazon. The areas in red mainly show criminal fires, which are provoked in order to clear areas for implementing cattle farming. The livestock activity is a mean used by invaders to prove ownership over productive land, which can grant them the right over these stolen territories. The very notion of productivity and the view of nature as resource is at the core of a current environmental politics in the Amazon. Indigenous territories are perceived by Brazilian state as wasted lands. Not only that, since 2019, Federal authorities have actively worked to weaken all legal and institution structures that used to guarantee indigenous rights. This is the territory Mãe Maria in the state of Pará. Massive fires have been documented by the local community. 
and these images were posted on social media three weeks ago. By facilitating the access to guns and promoting the official propaganda against indigenous peoples, the Brazilian government is not only allowing criminal fires. Today, invaders and militia groups feel authorized by the state to invade, threaten and kill. In theory, these red areas on the map could be useful to federal authorities to stop conflicts and avoid environmental crimes. But instead of preventing the flames from spreading, the government has been busy with questioning the data and attacking the credibility of its own satellite monitoring infrastructure. In 2019, first year of Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro's mandate, one case regarding environmental measures was heavily covered by Brazilian media. The director of the Brazilian National Institute for Space Research, Ricardo Galvão, was fired after accusations by the president that the satellite data showing the increase of deforestation in the Amazon had been falsified with the aim of harming him politically. A debate was staged and broadcast by one of the largest news channels in Brazil. The scientist Ricardo Galvão was put face to face with Ricardo Salles. Then, Minister of Environment of Jair Bolsonaro. The third actor was Marcelo Brito, president of the Brazilian Agribusiness Association. The configuration of speakers at the table is far from being neutral. You have representations of the scientific principles, of the cynical denial, of the free market, and of the democratic mediation. Why no member of the indigenous communities the ones affected the most by the first station were present. Throughout 45 minutes of debate, Galvão witnessed the integrity of his position as a scientist being questioned over and over. His discomfort was visible. But where does his discomfort come from? It reminded me of a character that lived a very similar situation yet in another stage. During the theater play Gaia Global Circus, a collaboration between Bruno Latour and a French theater group, one of the characters, Virginie, is a climatologist. In one of the scenes, she finds herself also in a very uncomfortable discussion with Ted, a climate skeptic. The discomfort felt by both Galvão and Virginie comes from the same difficulty of sustaining their position without undermining the foundations of their own field of knowledge. For centuries, the scientific method was built as the ultimate expression of notions like objectivity, impartiality, and universality. Notions that, through the historical affiliation of science with colonial enterprises, proved to be convenient idealizations for Europeans. Even so, we can say that the perspective of Western modern scientists is historically based on the search for neutrality. And the origins of modern science coincides with the origins of colonialism. Both help to shape the illusion of a non-situated and therefore universal point of view the illusion of a perspective that conceals the subjective body and places itself beyond any perspective. In the name of universality, bearers of reason made themselves spokesperson for all peoples. Through science and colonialism, the authority of the Western gaze was built on the ideal model of an invisible man. This is a still shot from the film The Invisible Man from 1933. It is an adaptation of the late 19th century sci-fi novel by H.G. Wells. The book 
tells the story of a scientist obsessed with the idea of becoming invisible. Like similar horror stories from the period, the rational man gets lost in the promises of his own rationality and ends up carried away by the power of his invisibility. An invisible man can rule the world. Nobody will see him come. Nobody will see him go. Don't worry, the whole world is my hiding place. As you can see in this shot, the clothes and the bandage of the character are filmic devices used to reveal the invisible body. So for instance, in this scene, someone enters the room while the invisible man is having dinner. He is caught off guard and tries to hide his invisibility with a napkin. A couple of years ago, a new Hollywood version came out. In the new adaptation, it is precisely the clothing that makes the scientist invisible. Specialized in optics, the scientist developed a new camouflage technology. After faking his suicide, he starts using his invention, an invisibility suit, in order to keep an abusive relationship with his wife, Cecilia. In the scene, Cecilia manages to reveal the presence of the invisible body for the first time. After taking the scientist to the attic, she pours a bucket of paint over him, revealing fragments of a white body. Again and again, the color white is used to give body to the invisible character. In the book Towards a Global Idea of Race, Professor Denise Ferreira da Silva highlights how science and history were used as the two main weapons for the construction of the modern subject while deliberately ignoring racial aspects. We can say science and history were developed through a modern practice of concealment of bodies. While white ones disappeared through a self-identification with universality, indigenous and black ones were frequently concealed under the ground. The same project allowed the first to conceal oneself in reality and the later to be concealed from reality. So the deadlock faced by Galvão and Virginie has to do with preserving the distance and impartial authority of a scientist figure traditionally built according to the model of invisible men and women. In the following clip, we can see the frequent disclaimer Galvão used during the debate to prove his impartiality. Primeiro, para não dar a impressão que eu estou fazendo um discurso uh, político, primeiro eu quero dizer que aí não há uma questão, primeiro, política. Porque a primeira pessoa que criticou o, o, os dados do INPE foi o, o, o presidente Sanei, e depois, em 2008, o Blairo Marge, inclusive com Lula, criticaram os dados do INPE. Então, não, não tem questão uma... ideológica aqui. Com uma grande frustração, principalmente por causa da configuração dos speakers na mesa, Galvão became more and more isolated in his attempt to show the credibility of scientific studies. Os estudos são enormes. O que nós temos, você, o, o Marcelo está falando de, de, de coisas publicadas na imprensa, o que nós usamos é a publicação científica, ministro. Eu, quando fui ver o que eles falam, fui ver trabalho científico. Não balela, como vocês usam. Não coisa de jornalzinho, de Twitter. Admiro, desculpe, Marcelo, que use Twitter. Eu não uso Twitter. After stating he doesn't use Twitter, the journalist makes an unfortunate comment. Galvão fell into the stereotypical character of a alienated scientist, obsessed with his numbers and completely out of touch with the world. Cornered, as his last resort, he claimed the universality of scientific discourse. Fala em ciência. Quando eu, se entendo, fala, eu entendo o que você está falando, Galvão. Eu uma coisa que um dirigente, qualquer dirigente de um país tem que entender, qualquer dirigente tem que entender, que quando se trata de questões científicas, não existe autoridade acima da soberania da ciência. Não existe autoridade. That was it. Galvão took the bait. What we see now is the backlash that comes from that. Nem militar, nem política, nem religião. O problema é quando é a ciência está disfarçada, a ideologia está disfarçada dentro da ciência. As the old saying goes, a broken watch is right two times a day. In a twisted way, 
Salles exposes the invisible man. Isso não existe para nós. Claro que existe. Claro que existe. A própria sua fala mostrou isso. Não. A, a, o que nós o que nós vimos há muito tempo é a ciência se arrogando o direito de dizer isso, isso, aquilo, eh, administrados na parte ambiental por aqueles que também se arvoram de conhecedores absolutos do ambientalismo. He describes scientists as absolute connoisseurs of environmentalism. Then accuses Galvão of taking a political side. Então, raciocínio, o, o raciocínio, é raciocínio há, uma, há um grau de aparelhamento dessas instituições. Não de existe, ministro. Total, o a sua existe? postura com o presidente mostrou isso. Não. I'm criticizing your reasoning. There is a huge political bias. Your attitude towards the president demonstrates that. Agora, você me desculpe. Fica o vontade. presidente da República, ministro, chamou os, o, o, os dados do INPE de mentirosos. Então, o senhor me escuta até o final. Os dados foram mesmo. Não. Os números estavam Se o senhor está falando... Nós o senhor... mostramos isso. Mas, ministro, só, o senhor me escuta. Só, só uma observação. No começo do programa, o senhor disse aqui que o senhor, o senhor não estava questionando os números, o senhor estava questionando a forma de divulgação. Here, the journalist redeems herself, exposing the opportunist contradiction of Salish. Eu deixo isso aqui pessoalmente porque ele veio e foi a razão, eu quero dizer claramente a razão que eu fui tão rígido com... Com, com o presidente. Não, rígido, não, desrespeitoso. 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 Desrespeitoso, de jeito nenhum. Desrespeitoso foi o presidente da República com a ciência para dizer: vamos colocar no tempo. O que, que ele falou? Ele falou: categoricamente os dados do INPE estão, são mentirosos. O que, que ele está acusando? Está acusando todos os cientistas do INPE, inclusive o Carlos Nobre, inclusive todos, o Antônio Divino Moura, todos eles de terem cometido crime de falsidade ideológica. Não disse tá nada disso. Essa é a sua diz, interpretação. Se ele disse que é mentiroso... Que estão junto com o senhor nessa história toda de que o governo não respeita o cientista. O presidente é uma autoridade política. E como autoridade política, ele tem uma determinada Mas não é visão. autoridade moral para falar isso. Não, não ele tem, tem autoridade moral para Ele é presidente da república, ele é autoridade política. O não, senhor, não é moral. O senhor, o senhor que coloca os cientistas acima dos cidadãos... Here, Salles nods to the audience and explores the common sense of scientific arrogance. By extrapolating the notion of absolute knowledge from Galvão's words, scientific discourse as a whole is reduced to a mere inflated opinion by arrogant individuals. And here, the lack of politeness that is expected from a distant scientific position is used against Galvão. While climate studies point to the need for coordinated action between governments to regulate the impacts of industry, neoliberalism pulls to the other direction, pushing less intervention from states, promoting free market individualism and national sovereignties. Here's the main concern of the market in relation to the Amazon forest. The most important thing is that between perception and reality, what is in the world today is perception. Então, independente de todos os debates que a gente tenha que travar aqui, aqui dentro, até para rearranjar o modelo de desenvolvimento, e nisso o ministro está correto, porque ele está rearranjando a casa, a maioria dos órgãos estava muito bagunçados, mas a gente precisa fazer isso quieto, dentro de casa. Mudar nossa governança dentro de casa, porque a percepção que a gente passa volta contra a gente. Esse tipo de debate, que não leva absolutamente a lugar nenhum, mas leva a uma reverberação internacional extremamente negativa. Apesar de você não acompanhar o Twitter, mais ou menos uns 500 milhões de pessoas eu acompanham isso, o mundo. Isso, então a gente precisa estar linkado. The unease felt by Galvão is justified by the fear of seeing his research being framed as ideology, or even worse, as just another lobby. Galvão finds himself stuck between a rock and a hard place. If Galvão would take the deforestation data to its logical conclusion, he would be inevitably entering the political and economical realms, which in turn could raise questions about the foundational objectivity of his scientific vocation. But if he doesn't, his only option is to hold on to an idealized and problematic form of universalism. On the other hand, the character of Virginie opens a third alternative option to this scenario. While confronted with the exact same trap, she decides to take the opposite path of Galvão, 
and in a flash of fury, she assumes her political position and declares war against science deniers. Maintenant, je suis Gaia, et toi aussi, connard. Confessing the earthly limits of scientific discourse wouldn't make it less objective. On the contrary, it would make it even more credible, as it would once and for all break with the idealization of an impossible impartiality. Three years after the television debate, the situation of the politics of denial in Brazil reached another level. The systematic budget cuts suffered by the Brazilian National Institute for Space Research made it impossible to pay the electricity bill. As a consequence, the supercomputer Tupin had to be shut down. Responsible for the weather and climate forecast in the country, Tupin was also used for climate simulations of coming decades shared with the IPCC team for the production of climate reports. Since 2021, a less powerful replacement computer is active, but it's no longer capable of making long-term projections. After three years of public exposure, Galvão has followed Virginie's steps. Hoje estou aqui com a Mariana Amor, essa querida companheira, o fundadora do movimento Cientistas Engajados. As reservas indígenas são fundamentais para a preservação da floresta amazônica. Para isso vai ser necessário políticas públicas muito bem articuladas pelo governo, atraindo inclusive a iniciativa privada. Eu tenho visto nas redes sociais uma reação muito positiva sobre o meu bigode. Eu no começo até estranhei, né? his social media, he wrote, You can't refuse a good fight, so I decided to enter politics. Today, Ricardo Galvão has 29,000 followers on Twitter. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, we wanted to just conclude the 20-minute the video presentation by um, sharing why we wanted to, uh, to bring it today and also to give Daniel, uh, who's live from Brazil, um, a moment to also reflect on the video because it was produced a few years ago. Um, we saw this video about a year ago and it's funny, but it's also deeply worrying. Um, it, it shows traces of things that I hear or see in bits kind of compressed into this time frame. And I'm, I'm not wanting to say that this can happen anywhere in the world, but it just, uh, it kind of distills something that I think is important for us to acknowledge. Um, and it acts as a, a basis for uh, what we want to talk about. Um, and I'll, I'll say one last thing is we were working with scientists for many months and they were constantly saying how they wanted to maintain their objectivity. So it was fun to see a, a scientist who stepped across the stage. Um, maybe we can let Daniel uh, say a few words. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Julian, for the words, Lisbeth and everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe just to give a specific context is like uh, this video was produced last year and things had evolved since then, especially in Brazil with, with the elections. And but at the same time, it feels that the damage uh, is done. I mean, it's very, um, it's very deeply rooted. And I think my interest in, in this topic came from the curve of this character of the scientist Ricardo Galvão to see how, how painful um, it was his struggle to reassess his position and he was suddenly dragged into the mud of politics against his will. I mean, he spent all his career in lab and, and then suddenly he's just... Uh, at the center of a, of a campaign of misinformation and fake news. So, yeah, so I was interested in, in see the curve of, 
of of this character how how he had to to change his position in order to to in a way um defend his his uh, research i guess and yeah of course the video tackles different uh topics that comes from previous works of mine the character is a fictional character from another film so yeah so there are many um things i don't know if i if I have enough time to maybe we can leave it for later Sure. Just to say, um, at the end, we'll have time to discuss further the video and how it relates to everything else that's been shared. So uh, hold your questions. Um, shall we move on? Yes. Yes. Are we? Uh, can you move it to uh, our slide deck, please? Oh, there we go. Um, so let's just to begin. Uh, Lisbeth van der Frift said at the end of her presentation that uh, artists and designers and other creatives cannot expect scientists to uh, understand what is being, uh, what, what is, the impact, what the impact of, of uh, potential collaborations could be with, um, with people outside their discipline. And so we thought that we would take a moment to share some of the work we've been doing uh, over the past year and a half, and it's by no means exhaustive in terms of what's possible, uh, just a disclaimer. Um, this one? Yeah. So we'll start with the proposition. Uh, and the proposition is that if we are to address the urgency of climate change, we need to reimagine what impact means, hence the question mark after the previous slide, um, and what it means in excess of the definitions that are in use now. And um, art, design, other creative practices can contribute to science communication and is what we're often asked to, to come in and provide. Um, but our work ultimately exceeds this. And so we want to kind of probe that excess in the, in the coming minutes. Um, so we'll begin with the most recent work, uh, which started at the Jan van Eyck in Maastricht in November. Um, we got a tip that in climate science, clouds are relatively understudied and unknown. Uh, and we thought this would be a good domain for us to enter into. Uh, the knowledge is still kind of coming in, and so the conversations are more free. Uh, we actually found out that due to satellite imagery, scientists are actually having to reconsider cloud uh, nomenclature. Um, and instead of using the kind of the Latin terms that have been that, uh, widely uh, adopted, they're going back to other terms like sugar and flour. And we thought that was maybe a fun, uh, a fun group of people to talk to. <coughs> And then we came across not such a fun article in the Nature Geoscience, which talks about the possible breakup of stratocumulus decks, um, which basically means that um, there might be a tipping point in if marine temperatures rise by four degrees, then this tipping point will be reached and uh, the temperatures will go up by another eight or even 10 degrees in addition to the previous four degrees. So that's going to be 14 degrees of warming, which is the end. <laughs> and when we or talked with scientists about this, for example, the lead author of this, he said, let's not be alarmist, you know, like this could happen. It's happened in the past historically, but it may not happen again. So, you know, it's out there, this piece of knowledge, but don't get scared of it. Um, and this is a conversation we have with a lot of scientists. It's like, what's the probability of this happening? And for us, it's more interested, interesting to ask, like, what if it did happen? You know, um, and not to investigate it in an alarmist way. Um, and so one of the questions we have, which has come up with talking with a lot of artists and other scientists and in the media is it's always hope or despair. There's all these kind of thought patterns that follow one or the other. And we want to know what else is out there, because we think that if we can kind of find other thought patterns and ways of disseminating knowledge and dwelling in different emotions, then we can start from different points. Um, so we started working with some cloud scientists at Wageningen. Is Giel here today? I don't think so. So uh, Giel and Menno, they do um, cloud modeling specifically to look at uh, how clouds create shadows. And uh, they gave us access to their model. If, well, okay. you can continue. So the one important thing that without the clouds, there won't be shade as well. So imagine in this future with possibly without the stratocumulus clouds, we have to also imagine the altered 
cloudscapes. And so working together with MENA and uh, HEAL, we asked them to model that catastrophic scenario from the previous article that we found. And um, what was different from our previous experience with the scientists was that they just let us do it. They were like, okay, what do you want? And we were like, can you please give us doomsday scenario? And so uh, why we were curious about it is because what you're looking at is uh, um, modulation of how clouds are formed in equatorial regions of the Earth. And equatorial regions are known as engines of the world because the streams, the clouds, the hurricanes, everything basically forms there and moves around. Um, and uh, we're looking at the catastrophe, yet it's mesmerizing, and we can do it for a while, and we can dwell in it, and does it help us understand what's going to happen, and does it make us really sad? I'm not sure, uh, but there is a beauty in that. And they asked us what color, what colors we wanted to use. There's this beautiful PDF sheet where you can just, you know, take a model run and change the colors around. Um, and usually they're trying to create some uh, or express some specific detail in the data. Um, so they want to kind of find whether this red to green or a red to purple or, you know, that's their, their kind of focus is how do we communicate this? And for us, it's not necessarily about that straight communication. It's more about what are we watching and does it allow us to pause? Um, we are coincidentally wearing pink and green today. We did not, we did not coordinate. And uh, to another project, because so disappearance of clouds, let's say it's like an umbrella, and then we made a few works which would be dealing with clouds. And so the previous one, let's say, stays in the um, uh, symbolic and poetic domain. And we were also curious about what happens if uh, we make I'm, I'm, I'm talking now. <laughs> exactly where I want to be. <laughs> uh, we were also curious about what if we basically give the role of an artist to the scientist and bring them into the art space and how does it... Because we are often asked uh, to do science communication when working with the artist and we're trying to make them understand, at least the scientists with whom we work, that it's not necessarily about communicating their science but maybe asking different questions. And so that positionality was also changed. Uh, but in the meantime, we were curious about making something more immersive and tangible. And during our research uh, on uh, clouds, we've realized that uh, all existing infrastructures of meteorological knowledge, they basically come from colonial history, slave trade, and then military complex, military industrial complex. Um, and being uh, originally from Russia and with the full-on Russian war against Ukraine happening. In my newsfeed, I see a lot of images of um, Ukrainian women gathering in the community halls and uh, weaving the camouflage netting together. So imagine in the future without the cloud and without the shade, camouflage netting is used not only for protecting something from the satellite uh, surveillance, but also to create shade. So we started thinking about what if we take that back from the military and do something else with it. And so we started creating this net, which we were making for about five days with six people. We were doing this in order to create this cloud form made out of parachute fabric and recycled cotton and thermal blankets to create our own cloud, uh, as well as the space inside the cloud, which would be protected from the sun, but not completely, as the cloud wouldn't black, block out all of the sun, where we could possibly have these discussions about the futures that we maybe have lost already and the futures that we could have, how we're going to get there. Uh, and the key part is that we had to come together, because the scale of the project wouldn't allow us uh, me alone or together with Julian to make this net. So we needed our friends, family, and community to come together. And uh, the conversations did happen. Um, and another thing was that we wanted to use the space for public discussion. So, so we invited some uh, cloud scientist friends from TU Delft to talk about uh, cutting-edge cloud research, 
uh, the potential of using uh, of cloud seeding. Um, and we also invited some members of Scientist Rebellion to talk about uh, their take on science and the role of a scientist and their kind of interpretation of science communication as protest. Um, so we had about 55 people. We also had a, a, a guided meditation. Uh, and we really wanted to kind of, um, I mean, we hear all these things in the news almost every day, but when do we get a chance to have that conversation amongst two groups of scientists who differ uh, and to have also audience members weighing in on it? Um, so the last project uh, in this series, uh, we had some conversations with uh, KNMI, the Dutch Meteorological Institute. Um, and you could think of uh, weather and climate science as kind of mediated by, by this uh, global infrastructure of sensors. Uh, and at the belt in, in Utrecht, outside of Utrecht, there's a whole sensor field where you can't stay too long because you might upset the sensors. Um, and so our whole imagination of the weather in, in, in data sets is informed by sensors. Um, and so what we're asking to do, and uh, on Friday we go to look at this placement of this box, and it's a series of uh, sensors. Sorry, inside the box is a series of sensors that are taking readings from inside the headquarters of the Institute. So it's a kind of Hans Hacke-esque piece um, where we ask this, this question, how can we anticipate, how might we anticipate and plan for future climate collapse in the comfort of this moment in this beautiful room here? Um, and so this box here will be accompanied by us having conversations with different members of the KNMI to imagine the position of that institute as it is now and as it might be. Um, so now we're going to reverse time uh, <laughs> to a project we did with Lizette back there. Thank you so much for working with us. <laughs> uh, and the Urban Future Studio. I know there's a few of you here. Uh, and the Jan van Eyck. Uh, and this is the first project we, where we were actually invited in to work alongside scientists. And uh, we worked alongside the image team at Utrecht University and PBL. And uh, for those of you who are less aware of integrated assessment models, this is, according to the image team, this is the world. Uh, so it's not just natural science models, but it's also human interactions. Uh, it's incredibly complex. Uh, and for, for several months, we were invited to have meetings with the team and to get to understand what these models, how they work and what they mean. Um, and then to eventually pose uh, a kind of artistic response. Yeah, and to give more context in the IPCC reports that we're getting, the main graphs that policymakers would look at in the summary would be produced by IMs a few in the world and then so like the all the scenarios business as usual or if we don't do anything or like ssp1 the green world will be on two degrees that's all thanks to integrated assessment models yeah um so in this kind of meaning making putting things together process we realized that uh there was actually no manual for how to model and so we thought that we could provide a service and create the world's first integrated <laughs> assessment model manual. Um, well, we don't know for all the models, but for image. That's true. <laughs> okay. Um, so in, in, in providing the service, we wanted to kind of reflect back what we heard, but also kind of insert some key questions. Um, so the beginning of the manual starts with some very elemental things around what image, especially, and other um, these big influential models are composed of. So for example, all of the models in the world, that it, uh, uh, not all, sorry, the big models, of the, the, the kind of most influential models, all rely on uh, contemporary economic theory. So the models imply growth. So if you want to talk about degrowth, you have to like individually tweak all of the bars to do it. But even before you got to do that, you'd have to go through the academic peer review process to propose that that was even a good idea. So um, we are kind of like telling the story of modeling and how in insane it can be. Um, through a very easy uh, explanation. Uh, and so these are the, the kind of conversations we had with the modelers. These are the kind of quotes that we were giving back. So it was also this very candid moment of like, well, wh wh why are we doing this? And could we do it differently? Um, and so it was also a way to kind of seed the manual with that. And uh, in the middle of this, this document, the URL we will give you later, 
Um, we try to define or explain models from different points of view, from creative professions, more creative professions. So cartography... The UI is a graphic user interface. We're talking about graphic design. Yes. So in the middle of the book, it says, like, what, 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 how would a translator describe an integrated assessment model? Um, and, and by asking a different... Uh, a person from a different point of view to define it, we come up with different in interpretations of the model. So for example, if you ask a translator, they would say, oh, an integrated assessment model is an act of translation. We take a forest and we turn it into an ecosystem and a bunch of ecosystem services, and then we put it in, in a... Commodities and numbers and data sets. And data sets, and then we run it through the program. And so it's this translation from a set of trees to an output that becomes a policy document. Um, and if you look at contemporary translation studies, they'll say, let's not hide the original voice. Let's bring the original voice through to the main document, because that might remind us that there's something foreign about that original voice that we might have missed in the act of translation. And so, for example, what if in a few years, in a few COPs, because of different IAMs, the nations of the world pledge to give nature a voice through legal status? Could it be that IAMs are the ones that put this on the table? So through this, through this manual, we're trying to kind of offer up opportunities to reimagine modeling through these different uh, relationships with creative practice. Um, yeah. And kind of the conclusion, it's, it's a spoiler alert, I guess. It's, um, IAMs are political. And, and as we saw with this video last, you know, like as much as science scientists try to create this objective piece, like there's also other roles. And we were not trying to say that science shouldn't aim for this objective method, but there are other ways of relating uh, through IAMs, we think. So you can check it out here if you want. Uh, and then one last slide. So this is what we did with Detlef, who we're going to be talking to after this. And we just wanted to say, like, well, you know, after that, what happened? Well, uh, on Friday, we have a meeting at the Plan Bureau in Den Haag, where we're bringing in a science fiction writer, uh, which was another piece from the, mo the manual. Uh, and then next week, we have a meeting with a modeling research team at Zurich. So we're really hoping to kind of build on these experiences and continue working with scientists to see what a future IAM could be like. Yeah, and uh, just as a like disclaimer, we not trying to say that we know how to do the modeling better. We're just advocating for, for instance, instead of having experts, having collaborators, and again, what Lisbeth said at the beginning, both Lisbeth were talking about at the beginning, that we need to engage more. And uh, that future that we are hoping to have is hopefully also shared future. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, is Detlef van Furen actually joining us? That's a good question. <laughs> Maybe we can take a seat and start and see if he's <laughs> coming in. Great. So thank you very much for talking us through your last projects. And that was really fascinating. Um, but maybe we, well, first of all, I have maybe a, a question uh, Lisbeth was already saying, uh, well, we don't really know who the audience is. Who of you is actually familiar with integrated assessment models? Do we have, oh, that's quite a few. So that's great. So hopefully you can also like afterwards in the discussion uh, join in and... Half of them were working with us on the project. Okay, so you are, you are also familiar with the work of the two, which of course doesn't make you the perfect like critics in the sense that you might be involved, no, no objective positionality. But I, I would like to hear fr from uh, you, Detlef, actually, how you experienced that collaboration or uh, what your, uh, just some kind of response to, to the manual. So I think we will, yes. would all be interested, yeah. You can, you can hear me well? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so I thought that was really an interesting project. Um, maybe to uh, quickly say something on the integrated assessment models, because Katja or, or Julian, I don't know, I think it was Julian saying that um, uh, these models try to describe the world completely, which is not completely true. Right? So what we try to do is to be relevant for climate policy. 
and therefore we describe the things that we feel are relevant for climate policy. But it's a very difficult thing, but because it's about the future. And so we automatically have to make assumptions about the future. And that's one of the reasons why I think this collaboration was so interesting. So for me, originally, I thought the collaboration would be about um, showing results that we produce with the image team in a way that is uh, more appealing for some uh, uh, some of the audience. And I, I know that in IPCC, we use some of the outcomes of the integrated, uh, of integrated assessment models to communicate to others, but that is mostly to people that like to read graphs. And there is a part of society that really loves, uh, loves that, but there's a large part of society that is not really moved uh, in this way. And so I think the art science collaboration can be already very strong uh, in realizing that there are different ways that we can uh, reach out to people and that uh, some people are much more moved by emotion uh, than by uh, boring graphs, while others actually are maybe more compelled uh, by evidence presented in a different way. And so I think that is already a really interesting thing. But that, that didn't happen at all in this project, uh, because uh, Katja and Katja chose a completely different route. Um, so the first thing that I think we realized during the project is that making assumptions about the future is something that we can do as scientists, but it should, should not be scientists alone. Yeah, because thinking about the future is not um, is not only the realm of science. And um, actually, when we do this modeling, we already realize that many, many things are not in the models. And the models have a story about economics, about population, about technology, but they don't have a story about politics. They don't have a story about institutions, about desires of people. And so what we do is that we create these narratives, which are storylines about the futures, and that we use as an input for creating assumptions in the model. And so if we have a storyline of a world that is developing fast, and where maybe people are collaborating, and we can make different assumptions about technology development or the effectiveness of certain policies, then in a world where we actually assume that there's a lot of competition and people, and, and where there's a lot of geopolitical hands. And so, but in creating these narratives, yeah, we can do scientific knowledge, but I think others um, should come in as well. And certainly artists, yeah, because artists have the uh, advantage that um, putting creativity in uh, is something really important. So that's, that's another area where, where collaboration is extremely interesting. And the third area, and that is what in the end Katja and Julian did most, was actually turning towards the, the modelers and uh, looking at, okay, what is the practice of what you are doing and can we somehow, from our experience, give you some advice on the way that you're doing this. And so that's what in the end turned out to be the, be the, be the manual. And I think many people in, as scientists are trained uh, from a natural science perspective, at least uh, in, 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 in integrated assessment or in, um, climate science modeling. And yeah, there we are trained with this idea of, of objectivity. Uh, we're trained with uh, trying to find true answers to questions. I think that doesn't exist really. Huh? The moment that you start to uh, think about the future and create scenarios. And um, I, th I think in the team, many people do realize that, uh, but at the same time, the they have to become aware, and I think the manual somehow confronts uh, the people in integrated assessment with these ideas. And I think it goes way beyond image. It's, it, it, it's it's something that should be looked at by other integrated assessment teams, but also by climate science modeling teams. Um, but it's not only about for the scientists. I think it's even more useful for the users of these kinds of uh, material to realize uh, that there is. Uh, uh, some parts of, of this work where we can, based on historical trends or by, based on knowledge about technologies, give relatively strong messages. But there are also things going into this uh, which have assumptions. And um, I think, therefore, yeah, this manual is useful for, uh, for people 
in research teams, but it's just as, as useful as well for users. And so I think it, it was a really interesting exercise. It turned out to be completely different than I originally expected. Uh, but I think we, on both sides, uh, have learned a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah, I have to say, as an art historian, the first thing I wondered, and we were talking about this uh, over dinner, was that in a project called Image, I would expect you producing images. But in the end, that's, or, that would already be a translation in, to talk in your words, right? So you're mainly, with these models, you're mainly producing numbers, which can be translated into graphs, and which potentially have, like, visual appeal. But one thing that you were maybe first hoping is that artists could help you like make these images even more appealing, these translations. But that's what you say, well, that's what, what you weren't interested in to do. You rather wanted to make the, the assumptions of the models, if not more appealing, I but broader, more complex. Is it, should I? Yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, we were interested to understand how, how, it, how it works and exactly what assumptions uh, go into it. I just wanted to let you know there is also a project called Picasso and there is coffee and mocha and, and like there is a lot of beautiful abbreviations in that world. No, sure, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm uh, not at all, I'm, I know about the abbreviation <laughs> factories. I, I just didn't mean it to critique, but for myself also, I mean, when, when, I, when I start to engage with the project to understand, okay, but this is, it's actually, a project that needs lots of steps of translation because it's mainly, and that's also one thing I think that, that, that is interesting about this whole question of objectivity and how to make impact and how to mediate knowledge that uh, if we are talking about climate science, we are often talking about numbers or we think about numbers and that, that's just part of the, the story, of course. And can I quickly respond because... Uh, we, we actually feel that we are trying to make possible futures um, tangible. And there, there, are, there are many possible futures. And what we would like to, to do is to show um, what could happen if we don't have climate policy, but also to show what would be needed to reach certain climate goals and what different routes are available. And for us, the word image is actually useful because we do try to translate that into things that you could maybe use to better understand these worlds, which are partly graphs. But we also, for instance, produce maps. We produce maps of global land use in 2050, uh, consistent with uh, a world where there is terrible climate change or a world that actually reaches climate goals. So, so for I can understand your uh, expectation that there might be more images, but for us already, we, what we try to do is to translate possible, possible futures into things that we can try to understand. Can I comment on, so uh, this idea that we were invited in for one thing and we did another, um, I think that's, that's... Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> no, but th this speaks to this excess, right? Like. I, don't, I forget the exact quote, but it says like we may communicate science, but we do we do more than that. And um, like like Detlef just said, the manual is useful as a manual. Um, and then there's also the question of like um, who who are we trying to communicate to, and w what do they need in order to understand what it is that's important, and do we know? What's important, and 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 we as as in a certain segment of the population, or do we know what's important? You know, and so it's it's not like we didn't uh, do what we were told. It's more like we had a different point of view, and we we are trying to kind of open up uh, to more points of view, and that's that the idea of impact being questioned. It's like impacts. Yeah, and I think really, I mean, I absolutely see what you are saying, uh, Detlef, about, I mean, if we don't say image, but we say imagination, it's actually something where I think the two processes come together. Because if I look in any, like, introduction to the environmental humanities, it says, well, what artists can do or what we need to uh, push is imagination. Like we were also talking about uh, di different futures, other stories, things like that. So that's, of course, imagination. And in a way, you are creating alternative scenarios. And that's, of course, a kind of science fiction, we could say. Only that you still base it as much as possible on like facts that you distill from the actual situation, right? Uh, what you yes. were doing is not 
communicating those scenarios, but rather imagining what would happen if already in the, the model would be uh, created slightly differently, right? So it's, it's, it, it's two moments of imagination within that process. So, so, first, so first of all, I, um, I didn't want to say, Julian, that um, you were invited in for a different thing. It is, it's more that my expectations might have been slightly different. Uh, and um, I, I and I deliberately kept those three things in because I think there are three very interesting routes how science and arts can collaborate. Um, and um, then maybe to make things a bit, bit more understandable. So what we one scenario that we run uh, is uh, a, a world where people eat less meat, and we go to uh, a healthy diet which is much more, uh, less meat intensive. And to to run that scenario, we have to assume, okay, in which year will people eat less meat? Uh, is this going to happen all over the world or is this going to happen only in rich countries? And so we create a whole scenario of what we want to show. And then the model can help us to indicate then what the consequences might be because it has indications of, okay, how much land do you need for the meat production, how much land do you need for alternatives? And then we can show that actually for climate, this is a big deal. But we, and this is a scenario that we have run, but already there we have to make assumptions. And then Katja and Julian are rightly pointing out that there are also many scenarios that we haven't run. And somehow we didn't decide to do that. And the deep growth scenario, for instance, is an example. And so pointing out to us that's, First of all, we're making assumptions, and you could help, and 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 other people can help us to make those assumptions. But secondly, you're political, and you're making in your work somehow also choices that can be seen as political, and therefore, please do it in a way that is open, transparent, and the manual helps a lot uh, with being aware of this. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, and it, it really relates also to what uh, Lisbeth van Richt was saying at the beginning, this like this um, dialectic in between techno-optimism and slowing down. I mean, this in a way, it is, of course, interesting that the, uh, the, the degrowth model is not the first thing you would be able to implement into such a model because it would request a totally different mindset from the start in a way, which is probably yeah more difficult to to implement in a way mm. and i mean but you were not you were also not not going like straight away in that direction i mean your your manual is quite nuanced and they're just suggesting some different possible uh, factors to factor in but not immediately saying yes but this is all like based on an idea of growth and progress I mean, we had a lot of conversations and uh, the talking to one of uh, Detlef's colleagues about uh, degrowth uh, that happened like on the first day we were working on the project, I think. And then we were exp we were told why it was not possible, or why it doesn't make sense or which way it could be. But basically, if you do something like this, then you're a loony academic and then you're kind of expelled out of scientific community and then like you shouldn't do it, basically. Uh, so we were not going to suggest something which were, we were explained that is not going to work. But I guess it just also, so we produced the manual, but it also made me think, well, you were talking about Detlef uh, making maps of the world. And then Lisbeth uh, Bick was talking about uh, maps and territories and us taking care of our territory. So I think we could, as artists, help you look at your maps differently and maybe produce better maps. But at the same time, we can feel that we have to be taking care of our territory and be making different maps and also, yeah, reaching for different emotions and working on other projects. And hopefully also, yeah, showing the scientific community how we can do that together so that there is scientific knowledge as a basis of a thing, but we're not straight communicating it, we're using it to create new narratives, which are more subjective than the ones that you have in the modeling world, but hopefully the ones that can unite people or make them feel something. Mm -hmm. 
Maybe we can also try to relate it to, to Daniel's work. Uh, I think that's really interesting because what we are discussing at the moment also is this question of objectivity, right? I mean, even if you model like alternative scenarios, you still try to base the scenarios on some factual information that you can like justify in a way. And in a way, the point um, Daniel is making, or he, I think he, what he is questioning, if we need to do away with this idea of the neutral, objective, universalist um, li like image of, of the world we are living in. And so he's actually showing that this scientist can't really make his point by always going back to mm. objectivity. So I don't know how you, I mean, you also selected uh, Daniel's work to, to, to counter to your own work. So maybe you can reflect a bit on how this, this question of scientific objectivity resonates in both cases. Yeah, I was just thinking, so for today's program, we thought of Daniel's film and then for the public program that we were organizing this summer in the net structure that we showed you, we invited both uh, cloud scientists from TU Delft and the Scientist Rebellion activist. And that's kind of two approaches. And when we were talking about uh, objectivity and if uh, the scientists should become more of a political actor, there were two approaches. So Francisca from Tivo Delph was like, my work, apart from what I'm doing, like my struggle is I'm making sure that my department stays and that we're getting funding and that we're doing this research. And then the Scientist Rebellion people really feel like their research is not enough. And, and I think both approaches are respectable. And uh, I guess we were struggling with this idea of, uh, yeah, the universality and kind of like the, the God view perspective uh, and all of these things, they, they can make you really frustrated because you know that this is false. Uh, yet some people in scientific community still stick to them and they believe that what they do is apolitical. And that, to us, I think, felt crazy. So um, in our public program, we wanted to bring also clearly political scientists, politically engaged scientists. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's why we like Daniel's work as well, because it's a, it's a great story. And it's a story of this one character, of one scientist, but then it allows him, in, in my opinion, to bring all of this complexity um, in, in one film. Do you share that frustration of that scientist sometimes, Zedler? Yeah, there's a, there's a f first of all, um, Govan was living in a completely different environment, of course. Eh? And uh, in the example in that movie, uh, he was more or less forced to uh, go out of that uh, objective point simply because he was was in a position with so much subjectivity that there was no other solution. I think from our work, it is slightly different. Um, and But it doesn't mean that I don't realize that there is subjectivity in, politi uh, in, in politics in my work. So we want, we want to be policy relevant. And uh, we want to, uh, we are, all people in my team um, are convinced that we need to respond to climate change and we need to go as low as possible in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And so we would like to help uh, the world ma making that decision by showing uh, different scenarios, different options to go there, but also to show what the alternative is and how unexpected that might be. At the same time, we need to be credible. The only way that we are uh, have some impact is uh, the users of this work can uh, can have the, the confidence that this is done in a scientific correct manner. And so when we make assumptions about technology change, we make sure that they reflect uh, what is the best guess uh, of the development of the technology and would not necessarily search for a very opti uh, optimistic view on solar cell devel uh, development or something like that. And so in the choices of the scenarios that we calculate there are choices um, and at the same time being as objective as possible uh, for us is is a high 
value simply because in the end, the world decisions in this world are made by a range of political parties and not only parties that are necessarily automatically in favor of green politics. And so, again, we want to, sh to show that this, the case for climate policy is really, really strong. I think we should slowly open up to the public also, so please have your questions ready. Uh, one second, though, I would like to give Daniel the chance. Daniel, if you're still uh, with us and listening in, if you want to comment uh, on something, I don't, I don't force you, but just to say that you're welcome to join the discussion. Yeah, thanks. Uh, no, I, 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 I think, um, yeah, all comments are very, uh, yeah, no, I, actually we can move on. We can okay, open great. for everyone to talk and I'll be yeah, here. No, no, we when, can you, when you want to uh, jump in, but there was a question already or a comment already over there. Uh, hi, thank you so much for uh, your talks, and um, I, re I really enjoy this. Um, I'm new here in the Netherlands, um, and I'm uh, just uh, keen to, to learn more about what you're doing. I'm working in the environmental humanities myself, so uh, I'll disclose that. <laughs> uh, I'm more about asking questions and slowing down, and one thing that um, kind of uh, is a question that, that comes oh, up yeah. to me, just seeing the film and seeing uh, you talk about your art and, uh, and listen to you, Detlef, about talking about science, um, is actually the indigenous perspective that came in, in Daniel's film um, and indigenous science and technologies that uh, are being shown to be more enduring for more just futures. And um, so I'm just kind of curious, maybe Daniel, you can speak to that. Um, but uh, I know that there are you know, scholars like Joshua Ho who have written about the history of science and, um, and just shown you know, that, that science narrative doesn't actually have an impact, and yet it's always like, let's get more, more science, more funding for science. Um, and that's his argument, he's a, he's a science historian, um, that, that that hasn't worked and that we actually need to think about other, um, other kinds of scientists, and um, like Robin Wall Kimmerer, um, who's doing indigenous science, but also like the work of the Menemone. Um, so I'm from, from the, what's now the United States settler colony. So, uh, you know, I'm just kind of curious uh, where that indigenous perspective comes in. Um, and uh, I think that came in most with, the, with Daniel's work. So, um, yeah. Maybe just other kinds of science. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, maybe I, I will talk more from the perspective of an artist and filmmaker. Like I have, like I come from, let's say, working with documentaries. So this idea of positioning in terms of of yeah, what kind of editing techniques and how do you lead certain, uh, how do you tell a specific story based on documents? And so I think uh, that's definitely very different than scientific practice. Um, but um, to talk, so I'm ju just saying this as a disclaimer to, so I'm, I'm talking from this perspective, but uh, for sure like the, indigenous rights, uh, especially here in Brazil, they were under threat for the last six years at least. Uh, and then today, like still, like as I mentioned, like the damage is done, like even though um, we have a, a current government that do appreciate and acknowledge the, the importance of indigenous rights for the climate uh, policy making, it's still very uh, tough uh, because a lot of, like even today, today, especially here in Brazil, they are voting, like the Supreme Court is voting like a new law for demarcation of lands, indigenous lands. So this morning we woke up with, uh, yeah, like roadblocks by indigenous communities to protest against this law. So it's in, this law is basically in favor of agribusiness which is the largest industry here in Brazil. So even though all these questions about positionality, objectivity, and even this idea of, of the map and the difference between map and territory, like in the film, you see this image, the satellite image. And then on top of that, you see like what's actually happening, like zooming in with these cell phone videos inside those territories. So I think, um, yeah, 
at least from my practice, I always try to zoom in and out from these two modes of representation and see what comes from that. But apart from indigenous knowledge and, and the agency, maybe I'm not like the best person to talk about that. But I do, yeah, they, maybe the, the, the another, another point, it's like um, my work also comes from the uh, investigating the history of science. And then that's where like colonialism comes in. And, and I think that's like the scientific uh, knowledge uh, was like, let's say, empowered over other forms of knowledge. And nowadays, climate, like that's the irony of our times that we're like, we, let's say Western, uh, are looking back to these indigenous people, which uh, whose world was ended uh, long ago, and then asking their help to avoid the, the collapse of this world. So I think maybe this is the ironic twist in terms of the history of science. Okay, so quite a few questions there. Hi, uh, I'm a researcher as well as an artist, so I have two remarks. Um, first is that uh, the both the uh, both the artworks were made me really angry, and uh, in the sense like uh, real emotions about we need to do something about it. And these emotions I didn't feel for when I attended two days econometrics conference for climate change, which was like 16 hours. So we need more of this definitely. And one thing that I feel is like uh, there are big terms in science, like integrated assessment model. Public does not understand that. We need to, uh, there is such a big separation between science and art, as in basic local normal people who do not uh, spend 16 hours in econometric conferences. Uh, the thing is that maybe science also needs to step down a bit and be more modest about the terms we use to make it more relatable to common language. I don't know how, but maybe that's a thought to think about. Do you want to react? You, you Do we need to respond? Does that we need to respond? Collect <laughs> some reactions. There's lots of people. Thank you, in any case, Thank you. for Thank that you. comment. Uh, yeah. I, I agree with your first remark about uh, emotion that you can feel uh, with uh, art, uh, the art was shown, and maybe you don't feel it as much with the science. Therefore, art is a very strong way of communicating. Um, and then on your second point, I, I also agree, but I'm not so sure whether it's, it's the science scientists themselves that should do this best. And they are relatively good in doing something, but maybe not always the best to uh, as communicators. And so it would be great to think of uh, people that help communicating science results. We're obviously trying to do it already, but I 100% I agree with you that should be done better. I'm a bit surprised that objectivity is now the framing for something being scientific because uh, the two pillars on the science for me are always that it can be checked what you uh, produce and it can be reproduced by anybody. Otherwise, it's our opinions. So science as such is, for me, for me, much more valuable than opinions. They are interesting to discuss with your friends or whatever and, your, and politics because in the end, nobody is objective. No human being can be fully objective. So if you frame science as being objective, you open the door to framing also science as being a kind of opinion. And it isn't. It's above opinion. That's, that's something I have really to stress, otherwise we lose any balance in, in, in society about what we are doing and what we are going to do about the problem. And to finish with one thing, if you talk about the climate problem, we also have to, to, to name what is the real problem, because I'm, I've studied biology, I'm a biologist, and I'm not so afraid of a, a, a mammal uh, species losing a little bit less than 8 billion examples because maybe it's a bit overdoing in the end uh, to survive as a human being, as a humankind. Unless you want. We can also collect some comments and then. <laughs> Hi. This might seem a bit triv trivial, but it relates to um, how 
as artists, we use or and visualize science. I do that. Um, and I'd like to ask you to unpack this image we've been looking at all the evening. Apart from the, the, the sort of humorous, oh, we like green and pink. I really don't, it's a beautiful image, and you look at it for a few seconds, you say, oh, that's amazing. But we don't know what it is. I really don't know what it is I'm looking at. I don't know how it really relates to physical phenomena. I don't know how the aesthetics you've chosen or the, the graphics design package, the 3D, the animation package affects what we're reading. But these are really important things because it's also the way all the graphics that are used for, for graphs or any kind of um, visualization of data, they all affect how we th what we th how we understand that data and most of us aren't able to to interpret that accurately <coughs> so can you tell me <laughs> what are we looking at i'll first say that i'm no semiotician um and maybe you could tell me more about it than i could i, I don't know your background but i'm an artist um, and i work with science a lot so um so in in trying to understand clouds, we came across these, uh, this Vimeo account of these scientists who happened to work in Wageningen. And their um, very short rendered uh, graphic images were super captivating for us because they were, not, um, they were not looking at clouds how we had known clouds. So we wanted to talk to them about the work they did and uh, why they did it, because it didn't have any application that we could see from the image. Uh, and then it became clear in this meeting that they use different points of view, uh, different altitudes, different time frames um, to understand how clouds are, uh, how, how water vapor condenses into clouds and how that interacts with altitude, wind, uh, wind speed, um, and under certain conditions, how it changes. And so, whereas with Detlef, the, the model was a kind of holy object that we couldn't intervene into, um, these modelers were able to just let us pick, pick the inputs. And so what we did is we took that very scary future in the, in the, the nature uh, article, and we asked them to visualize it. Because without the visual, it's just a graph uh, and, 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 and a summary that may be um, sensationalized in, in, in mainstream media, and then it disappears. Um, and so we, whereas with Detlef, he's very specific about how he wants to present the data, we were able to go into that space of uh, very scary future that we don't want to talk to talk about and to visualize it. And so what it, what it actually is, is it's a, it's, a, it's a bird's eye view of uh, clouds condensing over the equatorial ocean, and as the clouds come up, they're dark green. Um, or sorry, as the water vapor comes up, it's dark green, and as it condenses and becomes a cloud, it turns into this pink color, and then it disappears because the clouds are always in this form, in this process cycle. Um, so for us, it was the first time working with scientists when they were willing to go there with us, um, and they. Oh, yeah, you want to follow up? No, this is my hobby horse. Um, I understand that, and I understand the process, and I understand that curiosity, but the clouds aren't green. It's not pink. The vapor's not green. It's not pink, and there's no framing in this image. I mean, we've got a whole evening framing this image now, but there's no... I don't see the end of the world there. It could be, I don't know, a fungal bloom or something. You know, it could be awesome. anything... It could be just paint and, you know, I think for us, that's when we're the point. using aesthetics to engage people um, with ideas or to dive into ideas, scientific ideas and, and explore ways of just all aspects of, of how we all experience and are intrigued by the world. It's really important we think about how we aestheticize those things. And this is really amazing, but it, it's, I've, it's, it's risky just to use these kind of things without something in the image that tells you what it really is, the end of the world. Or what, I don't know. I don't know how you do it, but it's, it's just a, it's a lovely image, but it's, I really 
disturbs me. Looking I, at I think it's really, <laughs> I mean, it fascinates me. It makes it powerful that you're so disturbed with it the, the whole yeah. evening. But I mean, it doesn't hurt anybody and it doesn't try to misinterpret the, the, the data. Uh, and I, I, do you want to react on that? Otherwise, yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm a philosopher of science. I work with aesthetics in science, sustainability science, conservation, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and thanks for pointing that out. I think I completely agree with you. Like Im images, like they have all the like, meanings, blah, 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 and the colors. But I was very curious as well with this image because in the beginning I thought it was actually the Amazon forest being burned. And when they explained that it was clouds, I was like, oh, okay, like, that's very interesting, this perspective. But I thought that the green color then communicates very well with this evening, and even with the video from uh, Danielle. So I, at some point I agree with you, but I also disagree, because it can, in a weird way, it kind of connects very well and communicates everything that we are actually discussing this night. So it's just a different way of working. Yeah, I mean, as, as the art historian, I would also agree that if, if, I, if I look at artworks, it's usually to see, to be um, irritated, to see some kind of disruption, to see things that I was not expecting, and because that encourages me to ask questions, and exactly the questions you were asking. So if you would have found the general, like, like let's say scientific visualization, although they also often play with colors, I would say, probably you would have had less, I mean, this image would maybe have disturbed you less, but maybe also it would have like triggered less questions. And that's of course something that artists are really good at, at like, like, like provoking us in, in, in our assumptions and having us rethink um, Yeah, and it's, I also find it interesting that the image triggered the questions and not, I mean, maybe you, you didn't go as much into detail on the manual, but I still think that it's also interesting how uh, in intervening in such a, such a process of, a, of, 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 of a, a scientific modeling is um, maybe as disrupting for someone, uh, I assume, li like Detlef, but you have been using with them for quite a while, but that this, as soon as an image is kind of uh, abstracted or changed, it is in a way easier for us to immediately see um, the, the disruption or to see the intervention in a way. So, um, so, so that's what that's what you were expecting at the beginning, as you said. Like one of the expectations was, can they translate the model into images? And uh, actually, you in this project you did in a way create your artistic images relating to the, the cloud scientists. But in in the other project, you actually refrained from creating images, but rather looked into the the modeling process itself, right? There were a few images created there, but I guess, just don't get me wrong, I think that science has to be communicated properly and I completely understand what, what you're talking about. But here it was interesting back and forth between us and the scientists, and um, it was interesting to investigate their understanding, okay, what, like, if, if the brief is, give us the scenario, what color scheme they are going to go for. And the original video that we got was in color scheme Inferno, and it looked like lava rather than clouds. So then, you know, pushing it into more floral direction wasn't actually that bad, you know? And I think the, the idea that this is an imaginable future, and we don't know what color is it going to be and what is it going to look like. And, and, and that's also okay. And it can be this and it can be that. And it, it can happen and, and yeah. But uh, thank you. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much for the amazing discussion. I really enjoyed so much. Uh, my name is Stefan. I'm a designer and I'm also trying to work with uh, scientists. Um, and my focus is on the North Sea, and I try to uh, contact marine biologists and uh, marine spatial planners. Um, my feeling, also the observation from the discussion we just had now, is I'm very nervous of contacting those hardcore scientists, because I try to explain it's a different way of communicating. It brings out people's emotion. It helps people to remember the experience rather than look at a graph, and then after one hour, you would 
forget about it. I always try to communicate this, but I find the barrier there between the art and science are so hard because of the different training background. It most of the time um, doesn't bring me to the level like what you did with Deadlift. You work together on the project so far. Um, so I want to learn from you, like what, how, how do you approach um, from the first step until bringing a project together, but also a question to Deadlift, like after this project, do you really feel as a scientist you benefit from this collaboration? That's my question. Thanks. I, I th so Lizette was our like, what do they call it, Slotelfieger in Dutch? Like, she was our entry point. Um, she set up meetings because she understood how, how the geosciences building worked. She gave us key, key, cap, key passes, uh, followed up with emails, gave us uh, scientific reports to read before meetings. Like, you need somebody like that who can show you, show, open the door for you. And also not to diminish role of Detlef in this project, but actually we were working with Lizette and that was her research. And Detlef is one of her supervisors and happens to be a very influential person in the image team and IPCC and so on. But basically you need to find somebody as amazing as Lizette to do that for you. <laughs> and to be part of this conversation as well, because we, we haven't seen um, Detlef so much so, uh, and that's, again, I'm not like, that was just part of the process, you know. But to have somebody who wants to work across disciplines and is willing to understand what weird stuff you're trying to talk about and then gives you back the most advanced science and, and this and that, I think that's the most valuable. So, but how to make it easier? We went through this process because of the open call, but I think my suggestion would be just keep on keep on trying. Um, send emails. Maybe there's even people in this room who could help you. Mm. <laughs> so there's there's a few hands. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe maybe if that's okay for you, Detlef, we could actually ask Lizette to uh, to to bounce this question back to you. So what did you learn from this process, <laughs> or if if that's okay for you, if you want to respond. Thank you. Uh, it's really nice of you to say, uh, but I'm now like kind of presented here as kind of some kind of amazing savior or something. But <laughs> it's also, um, I think, really uh, difficult to see the value of uh, working with artists in, up front. So I think uh, so one thing uh, that I also learned is how to, how can you? Um, it's yeah, it's really difficult to to communicate what it is actually artists are going to bring. So what I really wanted to do is give the artists a lot of freedom to actually explore, explore themselves what they wanted to contribute instead of um, in advance already saying, well, this is gonna be uh, the end product. Because if you're working towards an end product, say um, an image of um, or a different visualization of, of a graph, for example, if you define it beforehand, you get what you expect, basically. So also, the um, yeah, what I also try to do is to give the artist the freedom to get something which you don't expect. And actually, that's, that's the value of also working with artists, is, is in my experience. Um, so yeah, but, but it's really hard to communicate for, um, because scientists are also working with really busy schedules. Uh, for example, that is also involved in the IPCC, which is all kind of work that he's doing in his free time. And so this, this is really hard to make time for uh, these kind of projects because it doesn't have a clear, well, impact is actually the um, thing of the, this evening. <laughs> what is the impact, actually? So, um, yeah, those are my reflections, I think. <laughs> Yeah, thanks to bring us back to that. I think we just we, we had lots of interesting discussions about how art can impact science or like mirror back to science, things like that. But you're right, we didn't really get into the the big impact question of how both art and science can like uh, act against uh, our uh, against climate change or. Uh, have a societal impact, actually. And uh, I also saw, I mean, but I don't know, I mean, your project, 
I, I see it very much. I mean, I'm uh, an art historian, so I do art criticism. I do write about artworks. And I think what I adore about your work is really that you take the courage to criticize science, not, not in, a, in, in a productive criticism, but I really feel that your main audience are scientists. And then it is nice if it gets a broader like art audience, but you really want to want to, to change in a way or to trigger thoughts within the, the processes that the scientists are used to conduct. So in that sense, and then maybe you, I don't know if you expect that through maybe changing or uh, encouraging scientists to think differently, that could also have an impact then on a broader political scene. Is, is, would that maybe be the, the train of thought or? Or maybe you don't agree. Maybe maybe the scientists are not your main audience. That would, of course, also be interesting to hear. No, it's, it, it, it's a debate amongst ourselves who the main audience is, and it changes all the time. Um, impact. <laughs> yeah, so we had this conversation with PBL. Uh, <laughs> Detlef has a... Well, uh, we had this conversation with PBL for the, present, for the uh, organization of Friday's meeting, and they are advising policymakers on strategies for land use in the Netherlands. Um, and on Friday, we're going to ask them to become political for a few hours. And for us, that's, that's impact. Like, I, I, I wish I could say more than that. But um, yeah, it, uh, we, want to, we want to influence decision makers. But we think that uh, in order to influence decision makers, we need to kind of um, align ourselves, orient ourselves differently as, 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 on, as researchers in all disciplines. And I guess that's where we're at, is how can we speak differently to policy by um, uh, coming together differently? I mean, that was very much, I think, also what you were saying, Lisbeth, right? Or, uh, so, but Detlef also wanted to say something about that. Yeah, but I didn't want to jump the line. But, but we absolutely need impact now. Uh, um, if we want to stay somewhat close to the 1.5 degree target, everything has to change. The way that we eat, the way that we produce goods, the ways that we transport ourselves. And so whatever can help to create impact is now important. And one route is the IPCC. But another route is to, to make sure that we communicate via other uh, routes, which are better in communicating emotions. And a third route is to help the scientists to do their job better. And so, therefore, I think the project that we did was extremely helpful. Uh, and to come a little bit back to the question about the North Sea, uh, I think what you need to find is simply those scientists that are interested. Scientists are just humans, and some scientists are very much absorbed by their particular work, and others are much more open and, and, uh, and like to work with, with artists. And you saw it even in our group. And so when uh, Katja and Julia started and invited people from, from my team, maybe six stayed with them and four left at some point because they didn't find it interesting. And I think that's the same thing that you have to do with the North Sea. So just find people that are that find it important to communicate and to work with you. Okay, I see, I don't know how, I mean, we are actually, and if I can, we have three very short comments and not have reactions on them. And then we have a final like one sentence reaction by. Okay. Thank you all. Um, I actually have experience being a scientist and an artist, so but it would be too long to uh, elaborate on that. I did make a project 20 years ago about climate change with art, but I have a question for Daniel because I was really intrigued by him, and since he's far away in Brazil, what, in my opinion, what triggered your story was the third perspective from the guy with the mask, or the person <coughs> with the mask, but also what triggered me is the, uh, I'm a business scientist, so I look at systems, system thinking, changes in that, the role of money. And for example, in Brazil, I don't know if any of you are aware of that, you had a huge scandal some years ago with the Oberesch, who bought off like all the governments in South and Central America. I was working in South America then. It was a huge scandal, the power of money, 
and he bought off the precedence of the countries themselves. Well, maybe Daniel can elucidate it, but, but I was really looking at the role of money and the role of systems related to money and how we as humans, scientists, artists, or whoever we are, a bus driver or someone, whatever, can change the systems, but at the same time, how we need to work together. So I was really intrigued by Daniel's story, but this perspective, how do you look at it, Daniel? from your background. Okay, Daniel, I have to uh, pause you for a moment. We take the second question that was still there, and then um, we have to run out. Yeah, um, thank you, everyone. About going back to impact and also finding these collaborations between artist and scientist. Um, I'm an artist myself, but I'm also working a lot in education. And it was interesting that tonight, <laughs> not a lot about education came up of facilitating at the point of artists becoming artists and scientists becoming scientists to start facilitating collaborations between the two. And that I think that's a place where um, impact can actually really come in is if we start at the point of education, teaching that it's okay to collaborate and it's okay to cross outside of our own disciplines and that we can't know everything, so we should rely on another discipline to make our knowledge richer or to make our communicative power richer. So the question of impact and in Dutch, samana impact, um, yeah, together, so already in the point of education and that brings it in a way back to policy of changing some policies about how we structure education. Okay, thank you. We have already two further evening events now, one about finance and one about education, and maybe there's a third by the last <laughs> contribution for tonight. Detlef, I expect that you, in a couple of weeks, we have elections. I expect that you have scanned all the policy programs from all the parties. <laughs> Which hard message do you miss in all these programs? Okay, great. Can you give us a one-sentence answer, Detlef? <laughs> so, first of all, what I mostly miss is a vision about how does a, uh, a net zero society look like. I think we really need a, a vision of where to go and how to achieve that and make it also attractive. So that's the first one. The second one is I really... Um, struck very negatively now by this discussion on the um, petrol um, uh, taxes and that they are going to be rolled back by January 1st. If you do that, 2024, you really didn't understand the climate crisis yet. Okay, thank you so much. Maybe we just leave it at that. Uh, thanks, everybody. Oh, do, do we have did. time? Do we have sure. time to go in there and talk yeah, after? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, we'll, it, it will continue. Okay, but Danielle can't join us to talk. So, Danielle, if you have a final sentence to say, this is your moment. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, no, I'll just try to tackle, I think as an artist, like our responsibilities are more in relation to representation. I think that's what we understand the most. Not so much about um, translating or, I mean, you can go there as well, but I'm talking... I'm, I'm saying that because in relation to money, I don't know if you know, but here in Brazil, like all the banknotes has some animals imprinted on them. And that's the character that was speaking and gave this lecture, the Macaw from the Ten Reais uh, banknote. So I think this idea of, of looking nature as, as resource and maybe translating to money, that's maybe... Uh, I'll leave it just there. Maybe that's a good perspective to try to address the way we understand nature and other ways of other knowledges that deals with nature in a different way. And and I guess as an artist, also working with science myself, uh, I think the collaborations in educational systems, maybe just to address that, it's maybe like where the impact is, is done like uh, the most because these are the the people that will become I don't know like uh, yeah lawyers and businessmen and if they know who what is the history behind I don't know 
colonialism behind a museum or some sort of infrastructure that might lead to new. The problem is that we don't have time uh, to wait. So I guess, I mean, that's a pessimist note. And but thank you so much for thank this. You so much. Thank you uh, for our online guests and also for our artists and for Lisbeth. And uh, thanks for all your interesting contributions.